All right, so thank you, Amanda. Um, I always feel a little awkward when she says that because we've worked together for 15, 16 years, and if you really want to know who runs both the Coast Fork and the McKenzie, just kind of take a guess. Uh, so really happy to be here uh, this evening. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm here, I'm going to talk about uh, a very large and exciting project uh, that we've been implementing with the McKenzie River Ranger District, uh, the uh, Forest Service on the South Fork McKenzie downstream of Cougar Dam. I've got a ton of slides and I've got about 45 minutes to uh, squeeze them all in there. And so parts of this I'm going to go really fast. Um, and other parts I'll try to like, that I think are more interesting, I'll try to actually uh, 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 spread out a little bit. So, and I'll try to keep the microphone close to my mouth. So, all right, so this is what we're gonna do this evening. Um, so what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of background um, and try to define what this kind of loaded term stage zero actually means this evening. Um, talk a little bit about why we're actually working on the South Fork. Um, and then talk about what we've done over the course of two years of implementation, uh, phase one and phase two. We hope to have a phase three and phase four um, over the next three or four years. Um, and then talk about a really exciting monitoring project uh, that we're actually starting uh, actually in 2019. And then take ha hopefully have some time for some questions. All right, so the washed out screens are not going to do us any favors this evening. Um, but what the, uh, what the top of this screen says here is this term stage zero actually comes from an academic paper by Kluwer and Thorne published in 2013. Um, and the really interesting thing with this is that this suite of projects has been developed over the course of 10, 15 years, or at least this design and this methodology and it wasn't really into, until like 2016, 2017, that the folks doing this work even became aware of the academic work and actually found this paper and then said, hey, this paper is kind of defining what we're doing. And so, oh, go back one. And so what we've come up with in terms of a definition of what state zero actually means is this right here. And so what we're trying to do is work on a valley scale, implement essentially from hill slope to hill slope, um, increase connectivity um, not only at high flows, but at summertime base flows, and set it up in such a way that the natural processes of the river can take care and sustain their pro uh, the, the project over time, which is a little bit different than what some of the historic restoration projects have really been focused on. I'll get to that in just a second. So I'm going to skip most of these because we can't really see them, but essentially what stage zero is refers to as was kind of seen in the uh, in the trivia portion is, so stage zero refers to stream ev ev evolution model, which if you've taken science classes in the last 30 or 40 years, you're probably some familiar with this diagram that you can't really see here. But essentially, the stream evolution model is an idea of how streams evolve over time. And the traditional approach has been the initiating undisturbed stage is this single sinuous thread through low elevation or uh, low elevation or low gradient depositional areas. Well, this paper by Kluwer and Thorne in 2013, go ahead, proposed a different paradigm for an undisturbed or a different, a different idea for an undisturbed stage. And rather than go back and renumber this stream el evolution number, put in a precursor stage, stage zero, that, I that they describe as more of a uh, braided channel network with a bunch of wetland complexes and smaller braided channels through forested systems. And the idea was that what the traditional stream evolution model was looking at in terms of undisturbed stage had been historically disturbed through eons, both artificially or 
natural occurrences. And so really kind of set the whole stage for, pardon the pun, um, for essentially a new way to look at actually how streams w can be restored back to an undisturbed state. Go ahead. Really difficult slide to read here, but the other thing that this paper did was look at a couple of different um, models for both biological produ productivity and habitat diversity at all these different stages and showed that way more productive at what would make sense is these way more diverse systems. Go ahead. Really hard to see. <laughs> all right. So this is a diagram of this state, sta oh, sorry, stage zero. Um, oh, sorry, I keep hearing voices. Um, undisturbed state here. And so what you're looking at here is a floodplain that's connected essentially from valley to valley with braided systems, a diversity of vegetation, uh, beaver habitat, lots of down wood. Go ahead. And go ahead again. And a stream system that has low, low um, stream power where the water table is high and you have conductivity across the entire low gradient system. Go ahead. So how this system has really changed over time when you start implementing or installing roadways, berms, converting floodplains to other uses, whether habitat or uh, housing, uh, agricultural uses, whatever. You've cut off the stream from that floodplain and confined it into a single channel. And what for, go ahead. And what you've done to that stream flow is take what was spread out across that entire wide floodplain concentrate that into a single channel and just think about playing with a hose back when you were a kid and so put your thumb on that disperses out as opposed to one single fire hose concentrated in a single channel that power that velocity is way higher and so anything in terms of habitat like complex wood gravels fine sediment for lamprey and little uh, uh, macroinvertebrates, it's easily flushed out of that system. And so when folks started paying attention to, hey, we're really changing the dynamics of our rivers back in the 70s and 80s, what can we do to restore them? One thing that came out is we can, hey, we can start putting large wood back in there, we can put boulders back in, but the concentration was back in that single thread channel. And so what you do, can't really see it very well. So we put in all this large wood, all these, all these boulders into that channel. And what we haven't really thought about is how that channel is actually connected across that entire floodplain. And so invariably what happens with a lot of those systems or, or, or a lot of that historic restoration is that gets flushed out of the system because we haven't addressed that stream power concept of what was a dispersed flow and a dispersed velocity across the entire floodplain is now concentrated into a single channel. Go ahead. And so what this restoration approach tries to do is address that stream power concept by removing that confine those uh, th those confinement elements, whether they're old roadways or levees, taking that material and actually filling those incised channels, and I'll show you those pictures here in a minute, and pushing that wood across the entire surface. So this talks a little bit about um, this shows a little bit some of those earlier approaches. We did some crazy things in terms of actually putting gabions in and chicken wiring or, or using w welded wire <laughs> to hold rocks um, in the system, um, cabling large wood pieces into systems, all these crazy artificial means to get 
uh, uh, roughness, to get wood, to get rocks, to actually stay in these hosed out systems. Go ahead. So that progressed a little bit. Um, how can we think a little bit more holistically? Started using uh, different approaches that were very heavily engineered and relying upon these, these really complex designs to get a little bit more structure into the system, um, to get that structure to actually stay in the creek and maybe get a little a bit of connection to floodplains. But once again, heavily engineered, um, didn't really have a whole lot of natural function to it. And expensive, I'll say. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and so the next kind of progression of this was using larger and larger wood, adding uh, whole trees, actually tipping streamside trees into these channels to try to get a little bit of more connection uh, with the floodplain. Go ahead. Go ahead again. Ah, uh, this is a shame. Okay. Um, can't really see this very well, but there's really an interesting story with how this design approach uh, developed. So like, oh, I think a lot of breakthroughs um, kind of happened by accident. So there was, there was this um, Forest Service project out, out near Sayusla, uh, or at night out on the Sayusla, out near Florence, uh, Karnowski Creek, um, very traditional uh, system there. If you're all familiar with Coast Range systems, small tributaries, um, the kind of these small tributaries that had uh, uh, braiding, uh, meandering creeks through this relatively small ch uh, uh, valley. When those were settled, the creek was taken from its valley bottom, put over to the one side and channelized, and then create a essentially grazing habitat or homesteads or whatever. And so early attempts at restoring that would design and cut a very engineered meandering channel through these floodplains. And so this is what this picture is trying to show here. Go ahead and go to the next one. Well, in this particular case, you had a landslide that came in and completely filled that channel. And the project manager uh, was like, oh my gosh, we had a complete disaster. What are we going to have to do? We're going to go back in there and, and, and dig this channel back out brought a couple other colleagues in, they started looking at it, started, started talking about it, and noticed that they were getting all these really awesome floodplain features, uh, that, and, and, and the fish were actually using it. So you brought that water, th th at this spot, you actually brought that water table back up, there were fine sediments and spawning gravels throughout this whole landslide area, and it's like, wait a second, we might have actually stumbled onto here, uh, onto something here. Go ahead. And so this is really a shame that we can't actually see this. Maybe we can get this up on the website or something. But so they started implementing smaller scale projects across like eight, ten acres in, in meadows in central Oregon where historic land use practices with grazing, um, vegetation removal, have really li have really incised these creeks where they're you know dropped down three four five six seven feet from what were historic wetted meadows um, and they've tried a number of different restoration approaches through the years to try to bring that water table back up and change that vegetation community um, with some of those gabions or sill logs across the creek. Um, try to tat, trap natural occurring sediment. Um, but essentially, using this stage zero approach, where you come in and actively fill that channel, which is what you can kind of see in that lower left corner, and bring that water table up in the series of a couple of weeks, what they found is within a year, they've completely brought that water table back up and changed that native plant community which you can kind of see with that, that, that green carpet in the lower right. Go ahead. So the one that was referred to, the, the kind of the earliest or the kind of the, the beginning of this kind of the stage zero concept without it actually having that name uh, occurred on White Juice Creek, um, which actually flows through Sisters on the Deschutes, just over the mountains here. And the idea was try to 
bring this very much in its size channel, which you see in the upper right, back up to an elevation that would connect it to relic and historic side channels throughout this wide and uh, unconstrained floodplain. And essentially what they did here um, was use surveyors um, and transits to go out and um, identify elevations in these, what they assumed were undisturbed uh, uh, relic side channels and shoot those elevations across into this incised channel, White Cheese Creek, remove any barriers or levees between those two surfaces, fill in the incised channel of White Cheese Creek, and so you've taken this single thread channel that you see in the upper right into this braided network down there on the left. Go ahead. The first one that we did in the McKenzie um, was in 2016 on Deer Creek. If you're at all familiar with that, it's up near, uh, just past Belknap. Uh, it's just off the highway. There, there's uh, kind of a really small, not so hot, hot springs that's uh, open and, and available to folks. Um, but what we did with this project, once again, without the benefit of really any tools or understanding um, what we were doing with this actual term stage zero concept was add a bunch of wood, but once again, go in there and identify those streamside berms that had been placed um, for a couple different reasons. If you're at all familiar with creek, this creek, there's a uh, E-Web power lines essentially go right through the creek for whatever reason. Back in the 60s, it was the straightest and easiest way to bring power from Trail Bridge down into the uh, um, uh, uh, Lower Mackenzie, put them right through the creek, put some berms in there to combine that creek to one channel. Um, and so this project, identify those berms, take those things down, fill into this channel, and you can, can't really see it with this picture, but essentially you've taken that, sin once again, taken that single thread channel and spread it across the floodplain. Go ahead. I'm gonna skip this. Uh, it's really hard to see with this washed out photo, but once again, um, really, so the whole point with this is that over the, really there was like almost 10 years of project development without actually having a term for it or actually having a, meth uh, a, a methodology to really share and interact with other practitioners. And so it's a really good example of kind of how, how uh, restoration is really kind of an involving science and really kind of gets field fit a lot of times. Um, and it was really with that Deer Creek project and why choose in, in, in particular where this methodology came together. Um, and then there was a, uh, an, an actual um, uh, paper, pu go ahead. A methods paper published on actually how to utilize LIDAR um, to, to develop these projects and come up with an actual design. Go ahead. And to date, there's been about 20 projects uh, implemented in the state of Oregon. Most are really those small scale kind of valley or uh, 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 meadow uh, projects on, on the east side. There's been a number. There's, a, there's been about five, maybe six projects done here on the Willamette um, that are a little bit larger in scale. Go ahead. Two of which have taken place on the South Fork Mackenzie River. Go ahead. <laughs> That's right. Thank you, Wes. I appreciate that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit why we're focusing on the South Fork. So go ahead. All right. So, you like that? I brought my own laser pointer. So, so Mackenzie River Subbasin, and <laughs> the reason we're focused on the South, so the way we prioritize um, projects is, first of all, we take a look at, even though we try to move away from more of a single species type paradigm where we're worried about, um, we're designing projects around uh, listed fish, uh, really single species type restoration. We're really trying to move away from that. 
Uh, unfortunately, the realities of funding uh, it really dictates that we, 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 we kind of stick with that paradigm. The great thing about salmon is though, it being kind of an um, umbrella species is that you restore habitat for them, you're, you're, you're really benefiting a whole hist a host of other species. And so the, the kind of the, the yellow and the green here represent spring Chinook habitat. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Wes. Go ahead. So this is all critical and historic spring Chinook habitat. Go ahead. We take out habitat that we can't work in either because of private lands or land use. Um, we're looking at uh, main stem Mackenzie, uh, huge recreation fishery. We can't really be putting large wood um, throughout all that and disrupting some of those million dollar homes. Go ahead. We take out areas that are upstream of the dams um, because we haven't quite figured out passage at those high head dams yet. What's great about the Mackenzie, though, if you go back one slide again there, is Mackenzie's really unique. We've got some really nice habitat in Horse Creek, Lost Creek, and some of these others in the upper Mackenzie. So we don't really need to do a whole lot there, but, and they serve more as like reference type condition. Go ahead. And that leaves, go ahead, a couple areas to focus on, including the South Fork Mackenzie River and Deer Creek. Go ahead. So not the best image right here, but what we're trying to show here, once again, so this is a LIDAR image, laser um, image here, shot from, from uh, and what you're showing here is Mackenzie River here, South Fork coming right through here, if you're at all familiar uh, with the Mackenzie River, there's blue, the, the uh, unincorporated community of Blue River right there, after Heidi River uh, Road comes up through here, and what you can kind of see through right here, the non-washed out part, is actually how many relic channel channels are throughout, are retained throughout this wide, wide floodplain. The Mackenzie River flows right through here and doesn't really access any of this available floodplain because of water management issues, uh, because of uh, residential, because of highway, um, whole nine yards. Go ahead. Can't really see this one at all. But the other thing great about the South Fork is that we've got relatively few, one road, one campground constraints on what we can actually do in, in, in terms of actually accessing and reconnecting this floodplain. Go ahead. Woo, that's a hard one too. So obviously with Cougar Dam going in 1964, uh, a lot of impacts, really degraded habitat downstream of the, uh, of the dam. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Very few pools, very few, gra uh, very few uh, gravels, very little large wood, very little connection to its floodplain because you've taken all those inundation uh, flows away. You've taken away that downstream transport of gravel, of large wood. Go ahead. And so in about 2012, started up a joint project with the Forest Service to figure out more of like a 10 year plan on how to restore this creek, or this river, excuse me. Came up with a bunch of goals that really focused on trying to restore amount of processes um, possible, given the fact that the dam was still there, so that this would be a, basically a self-sustaining restoration project. Go ahead. Ah! And so what we came up with is a four-phase approach um, to rest, re restore about four miles of the river. Ooh, thank you. Uh, four miles of the river uh, from the confluence up to uh, Cougar Dam. We implemented 2018, uh, phase one in 2018, phase two in 2019, and we hope to do the next two in uh, the next three to four years. Go ahead. Oh my goodness, okay. So what these are supposed to do is 
color photos that show actually how we design. I'm going to go ahead and flip through these. But essentially, this is talking about phase one. Actually, hold on, wait a second. So we've got the South Fork right here. Um, go ahead, Maggie. These are, so using LIDAR, we're able to identify areas of, uh, of the floodplain that either have artificial or natural um, deposits that are prohibiting floodplain connectivity. So these areas, these polygons here, are all areas where that 85,000 cubic yards is going to get cut. Go ahead. And these dark areas here are areas that are actually where you're going to take that material, fill into this in size channel here. What you can't see is this spot right here. There's a uh, relic channel that the entire river was diverted into. Go ahead. Because you're putting wo uh, water onto this floodplain surface that has evolved over the last 50 years without that water being on it, you need something on that surface so that it's not going to erode or channelize again. So we put lo large wood throughout. Go ahead. And then large wood throughout. Let's go ahead and skip that. Pretty quick little project summary. So we implemented this in 2018. Cost just under $2 million. By far the biggest project we've ever done. In fact, if you take all the projects that we've done over the, over the last 25 years, it would be a fraction of that cost right there. And so it just really kind of gives you a little bit of scale about how big, or idea on the scale of this project. Ah, this is, all right. So this is phase two, the design map. I'm gonna go ahead and skip through that. But the idea, actually, hold on one second there, Maggie. So the South Fork flows through here and there. And the idea was that we'd cut these areas here. They would open up a bunch of side channels through here. You take that material, you're bringing these uh, incised channels back up, and you have connectivity from essentially that hill slope all the way over here. Go ahead. So this starts with diverting the river. Can't really see them very well, but these are those super sacks from the trivia. Fill those with local material. Go ahead. And this is a nice picture. It kind of shows how halfway through the process, diversion dam goes across the existing channel. Portion of the flow is still going down the old channel. Portion's getting diverted into the uh, diversion channel. Go ahead. Until eventually all of it goes down this diversion channel. Temporary diversion channel. Go ahead. Once that diversion, uh, once the flow is, uh, the old main stem is dewatered and the flow put into the diversion channel, we've worked with ODF and W and some volunteers to do fish salvage. We moved probably about 5,000 um, fish out of the, uh, out of, out of the dewatered channel. Go ahead. Series of both seines and, go ahead. Electroshocking, we actually had some crews that came up from Cottage Grove, Al Kennedy, and the Coast Forks uh, youth crew came up and assisted with that over the course of a week. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right, and so this is what happens in those cut zones. If you kind of remember that washed out map where we had those polygons, we go in there and we clear all vegetation with huge excavators pile those up and save those for later use. Go ahead. And then start within those polygons. So what we've done is we, we, we've, we've identified a target elevation uh, that we essentially cut these cut zones, shockingly enough, down to. It's a series of anywhere from one to three or four feet. And that material then gets Actually, hold on a second before that material. So that's, a, uh, actually, go ahead and go. There you go. And so those cut zones, if you, if you could see this a little bit better without the washed out here, essentially becomes 
the dry bottom of the new river. Go ahead. So that material from the cut zone then goes into the old dewatered channel. We're literally taking a D8 cat, taking this material out, and pushing that into the old channel. And that's kind that's kind of what you see right there. Um, go ahead. And dump truck loads. So each one of these dump trucks holds about 25,000 or 25 cubic yards. Phase two here, we moved about 32 cubic yards. And so in phase one, we moved about 85,000 or 85,000 cubic yards. So do the math. I mean, it's just it's essentially once we get that creek or that river diverted, it's essentially a construction project where you're just moving material from point A to point B. Go ahead. Grade out that incised channel to that target elevation. Place large wood throughout. Keep going. Yeah. And then once you're done with the large wood, you do the dewatering and the rewatering in reverse. You close out that in uh, that um, diversion channel. Go ahead and put water back over your construction zone. And so go ahead and do this, and I want to go back and forth real quick. And so, uh, yeah, that one right there. So keep an eye on that tree right there. So that's the water, that's the rewatered project area. And that's what it looked like dry. So the same, the same tree. So go back and forth a couple times. One more time there, Maggie. There you go. All right, next slide. So that's what that project looks like. And I was really excited about this this afternoon. It's probably not going to show up really well. But what I tried to do with this picture uh, is put the design <laughs> on top of it. And I'll go ahead and so actually, so, so the South Fork is coming in from the um, right here in the upper right and curving around here. Oh, go back again, Maggie. So the, his, uh, the, uh, the pre project flow was pretty much concentrated in that channel right there with a little bit coming right through here. And then so what this project did is cut that whole surface, cut portions of that surface, a little bit of that surface right there, and then what you get is, and then put large wood throughout, and what you get is a connected surface from there all the way across there. <laughs> Go ahead. So what I tried to what I tried to show here was uh, <laughs> was actually how that plays with the design map, but we'll skip that one since we can't see it. So some before and after pictures um, key in on these trees right here. So pre-project, you've got one channel dominated by cobble uh, and boulders because everything is contained within that single channel. You've got these high velocity flows in spring and winter high flows that's flushing all these fines, these spawning gravels out of the system. So all you have left is these larger cobbles and these boulders. And so what this project then does is open up this surface right here and create a bunch of slow water habitat that Chinook, that lamprey, uh, macroinvertebrates all need to thrive. Go ahead. This is a this is a really interesting one as well. Um, so kind of key in on this tree right here. What this does is shows a really good example of actually how this project changes not only the channel but also connects water to the floodplain. Can't really see it with the picture, but what you have here is a series of channels being created throughout that that kind of that floodplain lobe right there. Another before and after. Um, go ahead and skip this one. This is an interesting one too because I really like this even though you can't really tell what's going on. It's a good example of how it takes a forested system to an aquatic system um, one thing to kind of keep in mind with these forested systems too is historically these evolved flooding on a regular basis. With a dam going in, you've taken those peaks and those valleys of those, of, of, of those high water um, flood events out 
And the vegetative community has uh, responded in kind. So really what you have is a, an area that would be, you'd expect to be more wetland dominated or mixed hardwood forest um, is really showing more trends of an upland forest dominated by incense cedar and dug fir. And so we, when you cut that, take those flood, the, 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 those cut zones out, what we expect to see is that vegetative community because you've r uh, raised that water table to respond in kind. And we expect that vegetative community to change from dug fir dominated forest to more of a wetland obligated and riparian obligated forest dominated by hardwoods and western red cedar. So phase two, 60 acre project, uh, diverted the entire 275 CFS flow into that channel that I talked about. We moved about 32,000 cubic yards. Uh, we had graded over half a mile of channel, placed about 1,200 pieces of wood, got it done in about eight weeks. And the contractor that we used was BCI out of Portland. Um, in, uh, coincidentally enough, they're the same folks uh, that worked on the Nature Conservancy project at the, the confluence of the Coast Fork and the Mid Fork. Go ahead. Project cost just under a million dollars to do. These are big ticket projects, but if you look at it broken out between at, at a cost per acre, so Phase one costs about 13,000 per acre to do. This one costs about 16,500. Average together about 14,000 acres, $14,000 an acre. If you compare those to the cost of riparian restoration projects or some of those more traditional uh, large wood projects, they compare really, really favorably. And we would argue that they get much more immediate um, uh, response from the stream system and the biologically biological community. Go ahead. And so what we've done in partnership with the Forest Service and OSU is embark on a four-year monitoring project. Um, so I th actually think this, th this talk will get a lot more interesting in about two or three years when we actually have some data uh, to show how these systems are actually responding. We have some really anecdotal evidence of what we're seeing ourselves as project managers, which is really, really encouraging. We're seeing this wood that we place stay in the system. We're seeing huge numbers of, of um, both fry and adults using these project areas, but we don't have the data sets to actually prove that. But through this four to five year project with OSU, with the Forest Service, we believe we're going to get that data um, so we can actually start pushing these projects in more of a regional scale and we really think we'll have a beneficial result on uh, wider scale implementation of these projects. Okay. So what we're hoping to do um, with the monitor, or what we're planning on doing with the, with, with the monitoring projects um, is both a look at the geomorphic response and the uh, uh, biological community response of these projects. One thing that's been a huge struggle is the trying to figure actually talk in geomorphic terms of what the or what these channels are actually doing in response to this restoration treatment. The tools that we've traditionally have in terms of stream habitat surveys where you're going out and you're classifying pools, riffles, and you're, and you're, uh, and you're classifying uh, what the substrate is, how many pieces of wood in there, um, how deep these pools are, how many pools are, are just n totally impractical in these project areas where you have essentially wall-to-wall -wall water across 50 acres. We, there, there, there are not pools, or there are not defined channels. There is, there is essentially just wetted surface across this wide area. 
And so instead of trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, trying to work with some of these researchers using new technology, using drones to define geomorphic changes, how complex these systems are in terms of the number of channels, the number of islands, how often they actually change course, um, what's the vegetation response doing, what's the wood, wood doing. We want the wood, in these cases, to actually move around, but maybe not move out of the project area because we don't want a bunch of mo wood moving into the main stem Mackenzie River, obviously with boating concerns there. Um, and there's some really d interesting and developing techniques using remote sensing, not only drones, but also LIDAR um, to, to track these changes over time. Go ahead. One thing we're also finding, though, is using that remote sensing, we have to have a, uh, uh, a ground truthing element to that. And so what we've done is establish 21 transects across the uh, throughout the entire project area. Go ahead. These are super challenging surveys. Luckily, I don't have to do them. Um, but uh, essentially, what and sometimes they take an entire day to do one transect. Um, essentially, what they're doing is walking a tape from valley to toe slope to valley to toe slope, taking measurements at each wetted area that they they encounter. A couple of examples of some of the metrics that they used. Go ahead. And what they're finding, ah, uh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a little tough, I guess. Uh, but let's actually, let's take a guess. So what do you think is happening with the, the, the velocity here? Pre-post, it's probably going down, and that's what we're seeing. What's interesting, though, is actually the max depth and the mean depth um, and I had a great trivia question for this, but I'll, uh, well, we, we, it, it didn't, it, we didn't need it because we didn't go to a tiebreaker. But the max depth, and both the max depths and the mean depth are staying relatively the same, which is a little bit counterintuitive because you've taken water that was confined here and you spread it out over a wider surface. And so what do you think? I mean, you have relatively the same amount of water because it's coming out of the dam, and, and that's controlled and regulated. So you would expect, because you spread it out over a wider, a wider area, that, that both that mean and the max depth are probably going to go down. They're really staying the same because what you've done is you've changed that velocity. You've slowed that water down. And so you're keeping that water on the landscape longer, uh, which really has good implications for that water table, um, and hyperreic exchange. And so not only are you holding that water there, it's infiltrating into sediment that's being retained in the system. It's, uh, uh, it, it's infiltrating into surrounding riparian areas being used by that vegetation. Um, so we really ex good example of how, how we expect that vegetation to change as well. Um, We've changed a, essentially, a riffle-dominated sy system into a pool-dominated system. Go ahead. And this is probably the most interesting data and really telling coming out of those transects is, so th what this shows is the green is vegetation. That little spot right there is a tiny little side channel. And then this is the main stem channel. So we're looking at substrate. The darker the gray, the more coarse or bigger the substrate. And so there's your main stem channel dominated by boulder and bedrock. Post-project, you've not only increased the width, the area of the wetted area, but you've also dramatically increased the diversity of the substrate, which is really, really critical um, for our native fish and macroinvertebrates. So this is kind of a fun um, image as well. Main stem south fork, the dark blue is wetted area pre-project. Post-project, or the, the light blue is wetted area post-project at base flow. So summertime, 
you've taken flow that was all confined here and dramatically increased that available amount of habitat. And so if you think about it and you go back to those mean, mean and those max depth graphs that we couldn't really see, um, you, you, you can really get a picture of how much we're actually increasing available habitat for native species here. It's quite dramatic. This is supposed to, supposed to show an aerial image from last uh, April, that high water event we had in, in, in March and April. Um, this, this, ma this, this image corresponds really well to that modeled image. We just can't really see it because it's washed out. Go ahead. Each one of those transects, we're collecting both macroinvertebrate and eDNA samples, which I think are going to tell us a lot about how fast the uh, biological community is actually responding to the, the, these projects and this huge disturbance. Go ahead. We're working with ODF and W uh, to not only track adults, but also juveniles, um, uh, Chinook salmon. So we're going to tag each year about 2,000 juvenile fish in this project, set up pit tag, or, uh, pit tag readers above and below the project, and tie those into pit tag readers at both Lieber Dam and at Willamette Falls, and be able to get an idea of how long these fish are actually staying in this project area, so you get something about their life history, uh, do some mark recapture studies, so actually to show how, how, uh, how big they are. Data um, to, to, to date is showing that these fish are actually getting bigger, um, staying, staying on the project area longer and actually emerging bigger. The idea that the bigger the fish, the more likely they have uh, of a uh, more, more better chance they have of actually surviving. Go ahead. Kind of the fun uh, and really the, uh, the, 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 the leading uh, monitoring that we've been leading with uh, from this last year is the re immediate response that we got from our spawners. Um, so between ODF and W, the Army Corps, and the Forest Service, they've been doing spawning surveys on the South for about 30 years. Um, what they found is somewhere between maybe a dozen or two uh, reds annually in that lower mile and a quarter where we've implemented phase one and phase two. Go ahead. What we saw this last year was 241 reds <laughs> in this project. <laughs> yeah. So we'll take that with a little bit of a grain of salt because it was a, it, it was a very much a unique year uh, last year. A uh, very high percentage of the about 5,000 fish that returned to the Mackenzie uh, were, were wild fish last year. And we had perfectly timed rain uh, that brought fish into some of these tributaries instead of spawning in the main stem. But even with the, that, the, those kind of sideboards, it's really remarkable figure that was found last year with that spawning survey data to show that that habitat is there one year or immedi really immediately after the, 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 the project. Okay. The other thing that I won't get into but will be really cool in about three or four years is there's a researcher um, from the Forest Service and OSU uh, that are uh, starting a food web study that's looking how that base of that food web is responding to these projects um, and, and really forming the basis uh, for what we hope is a uh, uh, remarkable recovery for our native fish. So a couple take home points. Um, South Fork is the perfect place uh, to do this kind of large scale project because of, of, of really s few limited constraints um, within the area. Uh, this stage zero approach, even though I didn't get into a whole lot, has a huge initial disturbance area. You know, we're cutting acres and acres and acres of riparian forests, which is really counterintuitive to a lot of the messaging uh, that watershed councils have had to the public over the last 10, 15 years. And so kind of describing uh, the nuances and why that's, why that's a good thing in this case and maybe not in other cases, um, I think is, is a point that will have to be um, 
uh, develop and explore as, as we're doing more and more outreach and really talking about our monitor results through this project. Um, but even though we're having that huge initial disturbance, we're still seeing the biological community, at least with the, this initial um, anecdotal monitoring data, uh, we're seeing those the, the biological community respond. Go ahead. Oh, Kenny Ramirez. So there's our project team. Um, had a really diverse funding uh, assortment this year. We had corporate uh, support from Intel. We had federal money. We had state money. And we even actually had county money uh, for this project. And so if we're coming up with a million dollars, we really got to kind of shake, shake as many trees as we possibly can uh, to come up with that funding. Um, and that really, even though this is an eight-week project in terms of implementation, it's about an eight-month project in terms of uh, uh, sourcing that funding, doing that partner outreach, doing that public outreach, and uh, securing that funding. So thank you for listening to me tonight. Sorry the, uh, some of the photos <laughs> didn't come through, and I'm happy to take any questions. I think you, um, you had your hand first. So another way that I think to think about that is is uh, disturbance, and so what 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 are some of the primary mechanisms to disturb? Volcanoes are one, floods are another, fire is another, landslides are another. We we we've developed all these systems in place to take away those disturbances, at least as many of those disturbances as we can. We can't really control volcanoes and earthquakes and landslides so much, but we've done a pretty good job of controlling floods. We've done really, well, in some ways we've done a good job of controlling fires, but in other ways we've done a horrible job of that. And so really this is a way of introducing disturbance back onto the landscape to try to mimic exactly what I think you're talking about. Yes, sir. So I think there's a couple things to respond to that. And so first of all, if we have kind of the event that you're talking about and Cougar Dam goes, this project right here is I think is going to be the, kind of the, 
the least of our concerns to, to, to some extent. But the, but, but the second part of that is this project is, 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 or this methodology is not a panacea. There are certain areas where it's completely the wrong or non-appropriate methodology. And one of the reasons that I don't think I did a very good job on, on describing is why we're working in the South Fork. Working in the South Fork because it has limited constraints. There are other areas like the McKenzie River in downtown Springfield where it'd be great in a vacuum to do this type of project and connect it to these huge sweeping floodplains um, next to north of the city of Springfield and the city of Eugene. You're not going to be able to do that because of homes and, ri and, and, and roads. Um, but in the South Fork, I think what you're getting and, and, and in, in other situations, I think you're actually getting a benefit because you're getting, you're bringing that flow up, um, you're connecting it to this wider floodplain valley to valley or hill slope to hill slope. And I think you're actually gonna get flood um, mitigation benefits, quite honestly, because you're spreading that water out instead of concentrating in a, in, in a single channel and, and, and accelerating that flow. Um, I, I would argue in the South Fork, in the, in, the, in the spot where this project was implemented, that would actually help. In other places, like, you know, um, for, uh, again, using, using downtown Springfield, then I think you'd had some ne negative consequences. Um, but once again, I, you know, really with, with that type of geological flood, um, I don't think anybody really knows um, what those responses are going to be, or in, and especially, you know, how our, our infrastructure in terms of our flood control in, in infrastructure is going to respond to that. Good question. Yes, right here. So, uh, with the uh, increased deforestation that's going on right now, uh, is that going to Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, I yeah, I'm, I, I'm not sure what the question is in there, more kind of a statement. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's been a huge number of land management changes. Um, once again, I would go back kind of the statement to, you know, this methodology is not a panacea, can't be applied everywhere. Actually, I think Mosby Creek, uh, which I'm familiar with, is, is, is a really interesting um, system, um, undammed. It has huge incision problems. Um, I think it's a poster child for what happens when you concentrate a flow into an, a, 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 essentially a single channel there um, that doesn't have any or very little connection with its floodplain. And you see huge amounts of stream power in Mosby Creek. That whole channel that I'm familiar with is then huge sections have been flushed out to bedrock. And if you go and look at some of the tributary uh, confluences, they're like three or four foot steps, bedrock steps from the main stem into those channels. And what that to me says is that's evidence of an unnatural system that is just flushing everything out. And so I think in certain cases, obviously there's consta constraints with the road and downstream private landowners. But honestly, I think elements of this design could work really well at Mosby Creek. Yeah. 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 
great question. Um, what we've seen and what we've been really nervous about and worked a lot with, so actually, the qu let me repeat the question, thank you, is, is there a sedimentation problem? And yes, there is a sedimentation concern. Um, we have not seen it come to be a huge problem quite yet. Um, and that doesn't mean it won't happen. The concern is, uh, is mostly, and where we've actually seen it be a problem, is around implementation. And so when we first take the water, when we first dewater the, cr uh, the, the creek or the river, put it into a diversion channel or whatever that new path is, especially this last year where we actually constructed that channel, you couldn't see it because it was, cause it, it, was uh, uh, it was really faded there, but we had about a day and a half where we turned about a quarter mile section or about a half mile section of the Mackenzie River on a Sunday afternoon, halfway, halfway brown. And so that was, that, that was an issue. And so what we did is we went back and kind of redesigned that, div that diversion channel um, to harden it up a, a, a little bit, lesson learned. Um, and I th we think we can prevent that into the future. What we haven't seen so much is the natural sedimentation with that first, um, or that first uh, natural turbidity episodes with those first kind of winter or spring flushing flows. Once again, I think really because you're taking, uh, you're addressing that velocity, that stream power issue, spreading that flow out where a good example is last spring with the, 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 the March uh, high water that we had that caused so much flooding here in the Coast Fork. What the core actually did is use uh, the South Fork as kind of the, the hold back. And so we held that water back there, brought it to full pool, and then about a week after that high water event, we started releasing that water into the South Fork. And saw so really, really kind of some of the highest flows we've seen in the South Fork for five, 10 years, about 5,000 CFS. We're really excited to go out there and see what that project looked like at 5,000 CFS. And we went out there and it was actually completely underwhelming. The water was calm, uh, the wood was barely moving, and it was all clear just because you've connected surfaces and you've addressed that stream power and velocity. That's not to say it won't happen. The other reason why I think the South Fork is really a kind of a perfect place to implement and test this scale of restoration using this methodology is because you have a controlled system. It's a little bit more unknown and there's a whole lot more variables in an undanned system um, of that magnitude. And so maybe instead of 10,000 or 5,000 CFS, last spring we would have had 15 or something like that. And I can't say what would happen at that. Sorry. That's a great question. So the question is, so we're raising the, uh, so, so we're, we're, we're taking vegetation out, we're taking that shade away, which we've been telling landowners for years and years is critically important, you have to take care of it, and we've set up all kinds of regulations about it. Um, we're increasing surface area, so we're getting more thermal uh, impact, right? And, uh, but what we're actually seeing in certain cases is we're actually seeing that water cooling in certain cases, not in all. So uh, in some cases where we're seeing it warm up, I think we're getting exactly the scenario that you're describing. But in other areas, we're actually seeing it cooling. And I think what's going on there is that you're actually getting more of that hyperreic exchange um, where that water is infiltrating into that substrate, stored underwater, filtering itself, staying cool, and then emerging back out uh, downstream. And so what we're seeing, so I didn't, I didn't mention it, but each one of those trans, uh, transects, uh, we, we've established, well, there's 21 transects throughout the whole project area. We're only actively monitoring about five, because what we, what we just discovered is monitoring 21 transects is a heck of a lot of time and really expensive. Um, but the ones that we are monitoring, we've established groundwater wells there. And those temperatures, those groundwater wells are showing, yes, yes, we're not only raising that groundwater, but we're actually cooling it. And so I think what we're doing there is we're increasing, we don't have a good mechanism for saying what's happening 
across the board with temperature, but based on what we've seen with those temperature monitoring with the transect is we're getting essentially a patchiness where some areas are warming up, um, but other areas are cooling. And so what we really kind of, the hypothesis is, is that's that patchiness um, is gonna end up being I hesitate to say more natural, but 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 a net benefit essentially because you're w well yes you are warming certain areas you're creating refugia areas um, that the fish will seek out and utilize and benefit from going forward. The other thing that I think will change dramatically over time is the vegetation response, and so uh, these open channels that are open to solar radiation are going to get vegetated, you're going to get, a, we're already seeing an, a, a really impressive uh, wil response from native willows, cottonwoods, um, that five, ten years from now are going to be providing that shade that, that we've been telling folks for five, ten years, twenty years, that it, is really critical. Yeah. Oh, I thought I had, all right, I'm sorry. Yeah. So great question. The question is about fine sediment. Sure. Sure. So the, que the question about fine sediment and can we do some essentially some analysis ahead of time to, to, to kind of get an idea on, on, on response. Um, and so the, the, to answer the second question first, um, yes, we can, um, but not necessarily for those reasons. Uh, what we discovered through phase one is a lot of times we didn't know, you know, so we're, we're we're disturbing like 15, 16 acres in, in, in phase one and we're digging down sometimes as deep as like five or six feet or may, may, maybe even more. We don't know what those soils are. And we've got a good idea if we go up and kick the dirt or look at the vegetation of what to expect, whether those are gonna be fines or cobbles or, 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 or gravels. Um, and so one thing that we did based on lessons learned from phase one into phase two is we went and dug some test pits. Um, we brought a small excavator in and dug a series of 20 uh, test pits that kind of helped us inform and say, yeah, we want to work in this area. Maybe we don't want to work in that area. Um, and, and so that's one thing we have, have kind of adapted to. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. The, the second part, and I'm glad you asked, a, a, asked that question, is um, we've been, you know, similar to talking about shade, we've been talking about erosion as kind of the boogeyman for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And, and when the reality is, it's a natural process, especially these systems here, they need sediment. They're sediment starved because of the flood control system that we have in place that allows us to live in Eugene and Springfield and, and, and throughout 75% or whatever of the, of, the, of the Willamette Valley. And yeah. And so, one source of that sediment is that lateral migration of these channels to erode and add sediment to these systems. And I mean we focus a lot on gravels because salmon are, 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 are the sexy species and they need that for spawning. But one thing that we don't really focus on is all these other critters like Pacific lamprey that need sand and these fine, fine, fine sediments for, Pacific lamprey are amazing. <laughs> anatomous, anatomous fish, but they spent, that, that live for like eight or nine years, but they spent seven years or more buried in the mud in fresh water, and if they don't have those fines, they can't complete their life cycle. And so they filter feed in these, in, the, in these deep beds of fine material for years and years and years before going out to the ocean, attaching to whatever mammal or whatever salmon and coming back. And so I, th I think this is a way to at least get at some of those more natural processes and uh, that we've lost 
just through our, 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 our land management practices. And so erosion in certain cases, yes, is a bad thing. In other cases, it's actually a really good thing and something that we, that we want to encourage where it's appropriate. And so I think that gets back to areas that we have constraints that maybe we don't want to implement this type of project, but areas where we don't have those constraints that let's rethink how we look at those lands, uh, how we look at that landscape, and if can we implement these essentially large-scale, whole valley landscape projects that are getting away from that single species paradigm to where we're looking at restoring as many processes as we can and restoring as many ecological functions that we can and spending as benefiting as many species as we can water quality, the whole nine yards. Um, and I think erosion is, 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 is a good example of that. So thank you guys so much.